Okay, we have uh, started with our second podcast uh, being presented by Tyna Technologies. I'd like to thank our participants for joining us today. Uh, we have Anastasia from Trade Station and Cyrus Daftari from KPMG. Just a little bit about our participants. Cyrus Daftari is a tax principal. Uh, at KPMG serving for their information reporting and withholding tax services. Uh, it's the practice within KPMG's interna international global automatic exchange of information network. Cyrus provides ad and advises global financial institutions and multinational corporations regarding the implementation, managing, and uh, monitoring of tax implications around FACA, common reporting standards, uh, everything covered within the non-resident alien world, as well as uh, U.S. withholding and reporting for backup withholding and 1099 reporting. Also, we're joined by Anastasia Rosavi. Uh, hopefully I said that right. Uh, you got it. She is the product manager at TradeStation Group. Uh, TradeStation obviously is an online brokerage, brokerage firm that offers education on mm -hmm. brokerage accounts, access to platforms to trade stocks, options, uh, cryptocurrency, and futures. And as we all know, everything's moving online. So they're in the forefront of establishing a platform that allows for consumers and customers to be able to leverage online platform in order to trade more easily. We are actually going to have a discussion with our panel around the implementation and the deployment of systems in a remote world. As we're all aware, COVID-19 has changed a lot of our life, life and our lifestyle. In fact, identifying more of a need to do work remotely. And even as we move forward beyond the initial outbreak and the control of COVID-19, more and more firms are looking at how they balance the number of people who are operating in office and the number of people who are, uh, who are working remotely. And looking and seeing that, we're trying to uh, go through and talk to what are the experiences with having to deploy a system in a remote world and operating remotely from home or from various locations? Uh, it's something that in the past people used to come together, used to manage a system deployment in a war room type setting where everyone was together and you could talk across and work through issues. How do we manage the risks associated with uh, deploying a solution remotely. How do you, uh, what are the best practices so that you can comfortably deploy a system in a remote world? So going, just touching on that, what I'd like to do is open it up to Cyrus. Cyrus, you've worked with deploying systems with various clients. What are some of the concerns that they have expressed with you with having to deploy a system and primarily thinking about this remotely, what are some of the concerns that you've experienced with them? Sure. You know, and Rashid, I, th I think as you appreciate, I've, I've sat on both sides, right? I, I've sat on the side of being the vendor and being, if you will, the customer. I mean, clearly from a vendor perspective, you know, one of the concerns is, you know, have the packages and the patches and the like been deployed, if you will, in the right order and, and are, 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 the, are they functioning uh, the way they're supposed to? Uh, of course, I think the other vendor concern is how do you replicate errors? Um, and one of the things I always say to people is a, a, as the users you're going through and you're testing and you're managing the, the, the deployment, you know, make sure you have screen captures that show step by step what you've done so the vendor can replicate. But really, I, I think on the client side, for, for clients that are deploying software, you know, I think one of the challenges remotely is really how do you pull together a comprehensive test plan? Um, and that, that test plan is harder on some levels because um, some of the environmental, if you will, controls are different, meaning people may have different bandwidths in terms of their internet connection. Uh, their, their laptops may not be as updated as they once were because maybe uh, uh, the company hasn't done some f f force updates or what have you. So, you know, making sure that you've got a, an appropriate test plan that also, if you'll manage for some environmental factors, I think it, it is a challenge. 
I think the next thing too really is anytime you're testing something remotely it is uh, um, coming up with test scripts. I mean, the test plan is one component, but you know, actually coming up with test scripts that you want to run are, 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 are a bit of a challenge. And I, I, the reason why I think it's a challenge sometimes it's it's a question of people not knowing necessarily where to start. I mean, how, you know, how do they go about putting together the, the, the test script? Uh, I think sometimes it's easy for people to describe the narrative of what they're trying to accomplish with with the new software, but really kind of making sure they're very methodical and they're able to articulate, you know, step by step, whether it's logic, whether it's data, whether it's operationally, you know, how do they make sure that, that they're able to, to, to have, a, have a test script that's going to actually reflect reality and, and, and test the application as comprehensively uh, as needed. Uh, so so I, I, I definitely think that, you know, from, from a client perspective, uh, the biggest heartburn that I, I'm hearing from people, particularly in a remote environment, is, you know, what really does a good test plan look like? How do they manage it? And, you know, how do people start pulling together uh, a few of an appropriate test for it? Anastasia, you, you recently deployed systems that were in a remote environment. Uh, were these the same concerns that you had? What are some of the things that you were thinking about while deploying remotely? Sure. Um, so I would say the way we function at TradeStation is very much remote even before COVID started. So we have talent that's working with us across the world. So um, the advantage we had there was that we already knew how the remote dynamic works during the deployment process. However, it was a tremendous transition when you have to transition from the office environment to your personal space, uh, working where your family is, where your kids are. So that was a big change for everybody. Um, but I do want to add to what Cyrus just mentioned, uh, test plans. They are extremely important to get everyone aligned across multiple teams. So whether it's internal teams working with business, bridging it with technology, making sure that we know what the outcome should be based on what the functionality business needs. But also um, our vendor in this instance, China, we wanted to ensure that they understand what our end goal is so they can align their te internal testing as well um, to ensure that we are prepared for this deployment. So adding that transparency across multiple teams, across multiple companies sometimes, is I think is essential more than ever, especially when you are working remotely. Um, it puts a little more pressure on having good communication and ensuring that everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and thinking about uh, bandwidth, or Cyrus, you brought this up, but this is a question for both of you. How do you work with all of the team members to ensure that people are on the same bandwidth or that you're operating so that you know, latency and lag uh, is identified as being whether it's from a system and from a core functionality standpoint, or is it just a, uh, uh, an internet service provider issue? Uh, how, how did you work through those type of issues? You're, you're on mute, Cyrus. I would just say, if, if I'm going to speak for myself as a result of COVID, one of the things that I realized was I was having all kinds of connectivity issues. And I, I have Verizon Fios, and like, I should be getting what I need. And then I realized it was the kids streaming videos and playing their games and, and other meetings that, that were taking it down. But then I also learned that when I had done my system, it was uh, five years ago, and it was under the old Apple technology, and I couldn't even take in all the bandwidth that Fios could give me. So... I actually had to upgrade my environment. So I, I think part of it is probably your ISP, part of it's just your own home infrastructure. I'm not sure any employer is going to be able to consistently make sure, you know, the, 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 the network connectivity is going to be the same for everyone, right? So I think that that definitely is a bit of a challenge because it, it's it's beyond things people control and some people may not be willing to upgrade their, their network. So maybe I was not a good parent and I should tell my kids to get off the internet and put them <laughs> Uh, I chose to, uh, to to expand the the, the, the bubble so they could they, we could all coexist, if you will. And, and right, 
And uh, from my perspective, I, I think uh, we do live in a world right now where we take advantage of the broadband um, and access to fast internet. So it did not seem to be a concern during our deployments with China. Um, I will share my experience recently, however, uh, with the recent hurricane seasons, and we had a recent release with another vendor where um, one of the key personnel who was involved uh, in the release, we, we had to postpone the release actually because he lost um, access to internet during the time when hurricane was passing through his area. So um, aside from just internet in general and the kind of services you can get, it's also the mother nature that we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, depending where you live, you may be, susceptible to um, hurricanes, earthquakes, you name it. So something that we have to consider. Um, one last question for both of you, and we'll move to the next topic. But and, uh, was it, did either, were either of you concerned that once you started to move forward, you couldn't roll back or go essentially uh, go with something that was more backwards compatible to reinstall back to your old solution? as a result of working remotely? I didn't see that and haven't seen that really be an issue, Rashid. The reason why I say that is because most people are testing comprehensively in a test environment, and that's a separate sandbox from, from production. And if they're going to roll something into production, there's a high degree of confidence. And, and if, for whatever reason, there's a hiccup when they're migrating to production, you know, my experience is people have been able to roll back the, the, the prior instance. I, I think, you know, the success of, of, of if, you, if you do have to roll something back is, you know, you obviously don't want to be doing something during the day. I mean, anytime I've been a part of these kind of rollouts and if you can roll something back, you know, you do it at midnight when hopefully you don't have people working at midnight. And if there's a hiccup at one or two in the morning, you can, you know, roll it back and, and put back the old environment. So I haven't seen a lot of effort or, 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 or a lot of, you know, situations where things have gone amok. Um, I mean, I think it's just something that you plan for as a part of a good disc test plan and you're prepared if you've got to roll back, you roll back, uh, um, but, but you, you do it, but you do it at a time that you're not going to disrupt, if you will, the other parts of the business or, or, or you know, the day-to-day -day business activity. Yeah. Right. And uh, from our side, I'll say that um, we did have a plan B and rolling back was an option. Um, we, we were leaving, um, transitioning from another vendor to China, and uh, it, it, it was a sunsetting um, vendor uh, or solution, rather. And um, so we did have some buffer of time in case we did need to roll back and do some fixes, but not a whole lot of time. So we were mindful of that. However, it was good to know that we had that plan B. I think that's one of the things that we always try to think about is timing. So from a China perspective, we're, uh, to your point, Cyrus, we always try to do our rollouts over the weekend when it's least likely to impact uh, production. So as we go through, we think about risk. Anastasia, what are the risks that you were managing around when you executed your, your uh, deployments uh, in the current setting? Sure. So ultimately, it boiled down to two questions. What if it doesn't work? Or what if it works, but it breaks something else? So that was ultimately what we needed to answer. We approached it um, by segmenting our releases. So if we need to isolate an issue, if let's say something does not work after deployment, we can isolate an issue and maybe roll back partial uh, release. And then, well, what actually ended up happening is the second part, that it was a successful deployment, but something else broke. Um, so it, it was not related to China, it was an internal issue that we, we did need to isolate a particular portion of our release and to roll back um, and, and involve business to practically do something uh, manually until we get that piece resolved. Um, so ultimately, we always try to have a plan B for, for instances where um, something is not working out or there are conflicting workflows and logic. Um, so 
in this particular case, I would say what we really were happy we, we did was isolating how we did our rollback so we don't have to do a whole process manually, but only a portion of it, and potentially do a backfill to resolve any issues that happened in the past. Uh, I am happy to hear that it wasn't our system process that <laughs> caused you to caused it to break. So, Cyrus, have you how have yeah. you dealt with managing risk or working with your clients in order to help them manage the risk uh, in, when they're deploying just naturally or even remotely? So, you know, I, it, it's a couple steps. You know, one is I, I I coach everyone first to get the business requirements that they can from the vendor. So everyone understands what it is that, that we're putting in place. Uh, two, um, I recommend that we, we get from, if you will, uh, the, the vendor, the, the data dictionary, so to speak. And, and, and the reason why I always ask for the data dictionary is I want to make sure if we've got to create APIs or we're going to ingest data in and data is going to come out, you're able to understand what those data elements are. Uh, um, because if you don't have that connectivity, that's where something can break. Or if you drop a data element that you expect to pass on to one of the other downstream systems, of course, that's where you're, you're going to create a break. So, so, you know, I think understanding, if you will, the inputs and the outputs are, are really important. Um, I also say, hey, you know, everyone has some test cases. I, I ask the vendor for, for their standard test cases. And the reason why I do that is because then you can build your own test cases around your unique set of facts and circumstances, but at least you've got a model to follow in terms of you see how they structure it and ought and, to and you know, run through it. The other thing I, I tell people is to spend time, uh, which I, I think sometimes people don't spend enough time here, is really looking kind of at, at the management reports because the management reports are always kind of giving you the, the data and kind of the things that you need day to day to kind of manage your business. I mean, there's one thing for straight through processing, but there's another at a point in time, be able to answer a question, whether it's a tax technical question or something else. And so, you, you, you know, you're turning to these reports uh, of sorts. And so you want to make sure that, you know, th that they're usable, that they give you what you need, or potentially, you know, a lot of vendors now are, are very flexible on giving people the ability to run their own reports, right? So, so you know, you, you can design your own report. That then gets back to the fact that you want to understand that data dictionary. So if you're going to grab certain data elements and make them part of a query, you can understand what it is. So you know, I would say, you know, look at business requirements, ask for, for, for data dictionary, ask for, for, for a test plan, um, you know, make sure that you appreciate some of the reports and, and then, you know, devise, if you will, some, some tests based off the data, based off the requirements and stuff that, that are really around your unique circumstances. Because uh, trust me, you, you know, there are always going to be some bugs when you build software. Um, but at the end of the day, we still have the ability to, 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 um, test for our unique set of facts and circumstances. Yep. And just going back to your your comment around business requirements documents, one of the things that I've I've experienced myself is that too often we, we look at business requirements documents as being one-sided, uh, where the, the, the actual purchaser or subscriber is the one putting together a requirements document. In a lot of cases, I think that it's beneficial for both parties to put together requirements documents, primarily because there's obviously expectations as to what's coming into the system, and there's also expectations as to what's coming out of the system. If you can't match the ma marry those two in order to say, here's what you're going to give me, so I can so I can give you what you need, um, it, it's not going to work as fluid as you think, right? Then that goes hand in hand as part of the requirements their functional specs and the data dictionary that all tie this process together. And, and if you're very disciplined about putting those things together and have and sharing them, your deployments are a lot smoother. So, totally. uh, any other yeah. comments, anything else that you guys have experienced uh, or think about in order to manage risk when you're uh, going through a system deployment? So it, in my opinion, it, it is important to have key personnel um, available during the deployment. Um, so in case you have to do some production testing after deploying and making sure nothing is broken or if something's broken when you have to isolate particular um, 
uh, you know, chain in the, or a link in the chain where exactly uh, the problem lies. So um, oh, yeah. we, we always made sure that we had representation from the operations side during deployment as well as technology side. Um, this way, if, if, for instance, we don't have access to particular systems to validate the functionalities that we are deploying, then, um, you know, having that personnel being able to jump in and validate uh, functionalities would, would be great without, especially if you're doing it during the off-peak time, right? So it, it does require some transparency, some coordination across multiple departments. So making sure you have access to all the systems you need. Right. So the the last topic we want to just go through uh, is best practices. We've talked about uh, we may have touched on some of these things already, but let's think about what are the best practices. What are some of the things that you've come across, and are things that you will take forward in any future future type of system deployment and integration that you have, uh, both remote and uh, live type of deployments. So Cyrus, you want to start? Sure. So I, I, you know, I, I think we've kind of covered a few of them. One is I would say, um, obviously, prepare your own test cases, right? Um, but more importantly, I would prepare a standard set of test cases and be prepared to rerun them over and over again. What I mean by that is, anytime your vendor gives you a new release or a patch you want to rerun your standard set of test cases so that you've got confidence that a new release didn't break an old piece of functionality. Two, um, whenever you do get a, a, an update or a new release, uh, you know, I always recommend that people read the release notes. Um, you know, oftentimes there are all kinds of good content and re release notes. Um, and I think by reading the release notes, you can then develop your own set of test cases that are targeted to, you know, whatever the purpose of, of the, the update was. So if it's something logic oriented, then you're able to tailor a new set of logic. And keep in mind, if, a, if a, there's a rule change and an old rule is no longer valid, you know, potentially then remove one of your old test cases and, and obviously replace it with this new test case that you're, you're going to rerun. Um, so so I, I, I think, you know, kind of having that, that in hand is important. Uh, finally, I, I think what I would say is, is, look, whenever you build software, there's always going to be some bugs and, and some, some hiccups. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything ever be completely 100% flawless, uh, even if there's a, there's a typo or something. But, you know, I think it's really important to prioritize the bugs that, that, that are mission critical and, and work with your vendor to make sure that you're solving the ones that are um, are. are, are are showstoppers versus the ones that you kind of live with and can be fixed in, in, in a phase two or, or phase three. So th those are some best practice suggestions I'd offer up. Anastasia? Right. Um, I'm thinking of my top three or four that I can think of is um, transparency. So engaging different teams across multiple departments and companies uh, early on, just so by engaging them early on, there's a lot less pushback down the road. So, um, and also communication is aligned. So talking about test cases, I know we keep saying test cases, test cases, but um, they truly align everybody, right, what the expectations are and what the, what, how do we define a successful deployment? So um, obviously everyone um, may say the same thing, just slightly in different terms from the technology perspective, from the business perspective, but um, it, it, it aligns everybody on what will be tested, how we're gonna be validating that success. Um, so having some tangible uh, line items that we can validate for is very useful to everyone. Also, if you are like us, where we have to upload data to China from another vendor, um, start doing this early on. Learn your vendor's vocabulary, vocabulary and see how it matches to um, your other older vendor. So ability to match things up and, and start validating information, identifying outliers, it just takes a lot of time. So give yourself extra time if you can afford it. Um, expect the unexpected, right? COVID hit right when we started doing our deployments and nobody suspected that. And uh, so ability to 
stay on track with time, but also giving a chance for everyone to adjust to these unexpected changes. It, it's a very fine walk you have to take. <laughs> Um, so keeping folks motivated without getting them burnt out. So this kind of leads me to my final point. And I think this is extremely important now than ever before because we are working remotely. Um, the value of human connection and something that we probably took for granted when we make coffee and we talk to our friends in the kitchen, our coworkers in the kitchen or grabbing lunch together. Those are the moments that we cannot have any longer. But, um, Focusing or putting more weight on having these human connections when we are talking re remotely through Zoom or uh, how however you connect, those moments when you are waiting for more people to join the call, right, those introductory moments, take some time to catch up just on personal level to really connect with people because ultimately you're, you're helping people to um, have a different reason why they have to go an extra mile just to get this project done. Because goals are important, company goals are important, but when you really enjoy working with somebody, when you really care or you don't want to let them down, ultimately that's what will help you to successfully complete a deployment, especially during uncertain times like COVID. I think those are all really great points from both of you. Uh, the one thing I would just add is, you know, it's always the last thing on our list, but seems to be the one that should resonate the most is about communication, right? Uh, communicating with all of the partners, communicating with all of the business. I think one of the, in my formal life, one of the biggest problems that I had is that we would do a deployment and we'd forget to tell someone that the change was coming. And all of a sudden, they're upset and they're, they're offended because they weren't included in knowing that something was going to be different about the way they were operating. So communication is always uh, the way to go. Also, communicate with your vendor. If there's something that you don't like uh, about what you're, what's happening with the vendor, they're not going to be able to guess those things. Let them know. Uh, most vendors are there to try to help and try to help solve your problem. Uh, and if they can actually make a change to make your life, make life, life easier and to do it the way you want to do it, 99% uh, of the time, you'll hear a yes. Uh, it's the very few cases where something's outside of their control that they wouldn't be able to do that and to do so. So uh, with that, uh, coming up towards the end of our session, our slides, uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, you both for joining me and actually walking through this. I do want to make sure that people are aware of our partners. I do apologize. I don't know why it's not showing up, but I did have your trade station, uh, uh, your trade station website. But you can obviously connect with Anastasia or people within TradeStation just by going to www.tradestation.com. Uh, we will be publishing a copy of this presentation and I guarantee you the actual website will be included at that point. Uh, I'd like to thank you both again for, for joining me and really do look forward to connecting again with you uh, in a similar type of setting and hopefully in a, another topic. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.